Today we'll be talking about the pneumonia second part. Here we'll be di uh, discussing about the ventilator associated pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia and COVID-19 pneumonia. Firstly, we'll start with ventilator associated pneumonia. It is a pneumonia present in the intubated patient and the greatest difference between the ventilator associated pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia is the dependence on expectorated sputum for a microbiological diagnosis of hospital acquired pneumonia and hospital uh, acquired pneumonia is further complicated by frequent colonization by pathogens in the patient. Now moving on to the etiology of the ventilator associated pneumonia. Usually it is a, uh, it could be a multi-drug resistance pathogen or a non-multi-drug resistance pathogen and which may include the streptococcus pneumonia or the streptococcus species, hemophilus influenza or methicillin sensitive uh, staphylococcus aureus or it could be a uh, multi drug resistance pathogen like pseudomonas originacea or methicillin resistance step, staphylococcus aureus or acetinobacter or it could be a brocaldia uh, brocaldia or a aspergillosis and uh, you should know that pneumonia is a very common complication among the patient requiring mechanical ventilator, ventilation and the prevalence of the pneumonia in a patient who is a uh, who, need, who is on mechanical uh, ventilator is support is, to, is uh, said to be present between 6 and uh, 52 cases per 100 patients. And uh, once a ventilated patient is transferred to a chronic care facility or to a home, the incidence of pneumonia drops significantly, especially in the absence of other risk factors for pneumonia. And there are uh, basically three factors which are critical critical in the pathogenesis of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. And the first being the colonization of the oropharynx with pathogenic microorganism. The second being aspiration of this organism from the oropharynx into the lower respiratory tract. And the third uh, being the compromise of the normal host defense mechanism in the patient who are in ICU or who are in uh, or in the patient who are in mechanical ventilatory support. Now, there can be oh, uh, various preventive uh, strategies so that we can prevent a patient, a patient who is on the mechanical ventilatory support to develop a pneumonia. That is, we can do it by the various mechanism. To stop the oropharyngeal uh, colonization with the pathogenic bacteria, we can uh, do the um, elimination, uh, we can do the uh, we can stop uh, stop the uh, use of the prolonged antibiotic course so that there will be no elimination of the normal uh, flora. We can use uh, even use the short courses of the prophylactic antibiotics, or you can uh, you can go further to stop the GRD. You can uh, go for the post pyloric internal internal uh, feeding, or there can be we can go for the avoidance of the high gastric residuals by the use of the prokinetic agents or even you can uh, you avoid the use of the prophylactic agent that rises the gastric pH so that there will be uh, there will be no bacterial overgrowth in the stomach and even you can uh, look for the other causes like cross infection which can be uh, prevented by the frequent hand washing, especially with alcohol-based hand drop, or uh, by giving the patient education by the health, giving the education to the health uh, care uh, uh, healthcare people, or there you can even uh, stop the large volume aspiration by the use of the endotracheal intubation, or by using the rapid sequence intubation technique, or by the use of the avoidance, or by uh, less lowering the use of the sedation or by doing the decompression of the small bowel obstruction. And uh, even you can uh, stop the micro aspiration around the intratracheal tube by doing the non uh, by using the non-invasive ventilation as uh, much as possible when needed or you can even do a, a do a daily opening from the sedation by weaning uh, by use of proper weaning protocols or you can even uh, I do the simple things like the elevation of the heat uh, from the bed, or you can use even use the avoidance of the re or you can go for avoidance of the reintubation, or you can even use, as I've told you, minimization of the sedation and patient transport. And uh, you can even uh, go for the tight glycemic control, which can lead to the altered lower respiratory host uh, defense. And even you can lower the uh, lowering the hemoglobin uh, transfusion threshold.
And how does a patient uh, with uh, bed later associate uh, pneumonia present? Usually, when a patient is uh, conscious, then the patient can uh, describe about the about his or her symptoms. However, the patient who are in ventilator support are uh, are usually not conscious, and they might be in sedation or they they or due to various uh, their disease pathology, they might be not be able to, uh, they they are not able to communicate about their symptoms. So we should find out. If, by ourselves, uh, or we should look for the, any clinical signs or any symptoms there are, so so that the patient can, so that which uh, leads to the suspicion that the patient may have the like develop pneumonia, uh, pneumonia. So the clinical manifestation uh, includes fever, leukocytosis, or increase in respiratory secretion, or there could be a pulmonary consolidation on physical examination, or even you do a chest radiograph, you can find out new or changing changing uh, radiographic infiltrates or the patient may have got, may de develop tachypnea, tachycardia or worsening oxygenation and increased minute ventilation. In all such cases, you should suspect uh, if the patient has got pneumonia. And uh, uh, pneumonia, if the patient presents with all these, then you should, uh, in the back of your head, you should have uh, formulate your differential diagnosis, which may include a typical pulmonary edema, or it could be a pulmonary confusion or alveolar hemorrhage, or it could be hypersensitive pneumonitis, or it could be an acute respiratory distress syndrome, or it could be a pulmonary embolism. Now, how do you do the diagnosis? As the patient uh, is not conscious and could not uh, could not uh, take out the cough, you should always uh, look think for the other methods so to collect the sputum of the patient, and it can be done by using the tracheal aspirates. And you can go for the quantitative culture approach. That is, uh, you take out the sputum from by the tracheal aspirates, uh, then you can look for the culture of that. Aspirate, or even you can go for the gram staining, or you can do for look for the differential cell counts, or you can even go for the particular staining of the intracellular organism, or you can even go for the detection of the local protein level elevated in response to the infection. Now you should know uh, if you think that the patient has got uh, developed the ventilator associated pneumonia, then you should uh, promptly uh, start on the empirical antibiotic therapy and the antibiotic uh, therapy before starting that you should uh, look for if there is any risk factor for uh, resistance gram negative pathogen or not. If there is no any risk factor for uh, gram negative pathogen, then you should give the patient uh, either piperacin, tazobactam or cefepime or levofloxacin. However, if there is a risk factor for the the gram negative uh, pathogen, it, then you should uh, always consider giving the two group of antibiotics. Uh, the first being either piperacin, tazobactam, or cefepime, or ziptazidim, or imipenem, or meropenem, and the next uh, group, which must include amikacin, gentamicin, or uh, tobramycin, or ciprofloxacin, or levofloxacin, or it could be colistin, or polymaxin B. And if there is a risk factor for uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, then you should ask the, you should add the patient uh, either linezolate or vancomycin plus clindamycin. Now, what to do if there is failure to improve? Because uh, failure to improve is a phenomena is not a uh, not an uncommon phenomena. That is very common in cases of the patient who has got ventilator associated pneumonia, and it is usually present. Uh, it usually due to the uh, methicillin resistance, staph aureus, and for such cases, uh, you should start the patient treatment with the standard dose vancomycin. And you should know that uh, uh, you should also find out if there is any other reason that may lead to the uh, failure to improvement. It could be due to the new super infection or the presence of extra pulmonary infection or the drug toxicity. And you should uh, ask for the serial, serial measurements of the procalcitonin level uh, so that uh, you could uh, find out and be in the track about the, in the, about the clinical response accurately. Well, re uh, repeat uh, quantitative cultures may clarify the micro microbiological response. Now moving on to the complication. What are the all the complications that may uh, occur in the patient who has got who has developed a ventilator associated pneumonia? Is the prolongation of the mechanical ventilation, which corresponds increasing the duration of ICU stay and hospitalization. There can be a necrotizing development of the necrotizing pneumonia, especially due to pseudomonas originis, and can cause significant pulmonary hemorrhage, bronchiectasis, and parenchymal scare. Scaring, or the patient may even uh, develop uh, severe muscle loss and gen general debilitation from an episode of the ventilator associated pneumonia, which offer required prolonged rehabilitation. And all this can lead to a death, early death. 
an if a clinical improvement occurs it usually occurs uh, it's usually evident uh, within 48 to 72 hours of the initiation of the antimicrobial treatment and uh, ventilator associated uh, pneumonia is associated with very high crude mortality rate as high as 50 to 70 percent now moving on to the next group of uh, pneumonia that is the hospital acquired pneumonia a patient is uh, said to have a hospital acquired pneumonia uh, if he has a lower respiratory tract infection that was not incubating at the time of hospital admission and that presents clinically two or more days after the hospitalization. And the hospital acquired pneumonia in non intubated patient, both inside and outside the hospital, uh, issue is uh, like very similar to ventilator associated pneumonia. And the main difference are the higher frequency of the non multi drug resistance pathogens and the generally better underlying host immunity in non intubated patient. Uh, it was, it's very similar to the ventilator associated pneumonia. However, uh, in patient who has got hospital acquired pneumonia, the uh, it is better in, uh, because it has got uh, because the more the organism that is included in hospital like pneumonia is um, non multi drug resistance and even the host immunity is better in the patient who has got uh, who is who are not in the ICU and the pathogens more common in the non uh, ventilator associated pneumonia are uh, pneumonia per population are anaerobics uh, due to greater risks of macro aspiration by the non intubated patient and the lower oxygen tension in the lower respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract samples appropriate for culture are considerably more difficult to obtain from non intubated patient and uh, blood you should know that blood cultures as i will discuss is are infrequently positive that is less than 15 percent of the cases and despite these difficulties uh, the better health response in non ICU patient uh, results in lower mortality rate than are documented for ventilator associated pneumonia and now moving on to the uh, covid 19 pneumonia you all people know that COVID-19 uh, uh, pneumonia has caused a pandemic in the world. COVID-19 is a virus that is associated with the outbreak originated in Wuhan, China and has been de designated uh, as severe acute respiratory syndrome corona by the stew or SARS-CoV-2 then the disease caused by that virus is now officially called as COVID-19 and before going uh, going inside uh, more about the COVID-19 you should know about the uh, little about the structure of the COVID-19 virus and it consists of the membrane protein nucleoprotein uh, genomic RNA and it has got a spike uh, glycoprotein and envelope uh, small membrane protein and you should know that COVID uh, coronavirus uh, falls into the order Ditoverales and family uh, coronaviridae and the subfamily coronavirinae. And it has got uh, various uh, genus like alpha coronavirus, beta coronavirus, gamma coronavirus, and delta coronavirus. And uh, you should know that. Uh, since the world is uh, currently going through a pandemic, uh, you should know how it's going to get uh, progress. Uh, usually, uh, there is uh, there are various uh, phases, and in phase uh, from phase one to three, it is predominantly animal infection with very few human infection, and in phase four, there is sustained human to human transmission, and in phase five to six pandemic, there is widespread human infection, and uh, after that, there will be post peak with uh, widespread uh, human infection, and there will be post pandemic uh, state in which there will be disease activity at the seasonal level. Now, uh, data, uh, now seeing out the uh, at the case uh, cases present in of the coronavirus around in the world we can say that our world is currently in the post peak phase of the coronavirus infection now moving on to the various case definition a patient is said to have a, a suspected case if a patient has got fever cough suddenness of breath chills muscle pain new loss of taste or smell diarrhea or sore throat in the last 14 days and has no alternative explanation of the symptom and the patient is said to have be a probable case if there is a suspected case whom the testing for coronavirus is inconclusive or a a suspected case for whom testing could not be performed for any reason and the patient is said to have a confirmed case of coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, if a patient person uh, has a laboratory confirmation of the corona COVID-19 infection and irrespective of the clinical signs and symptoms. 
And now moving on to the clinical presentation. Usually the incubation period for COVID-19 is estimated to be two to uh, 14 days from the time of exposure with medium incubation period being four to five days. And the illness spectrum ranges from asymptomatic infection to the acute respiratory distress syndrome and multi-organ dysfunction. As per current best estimates by the uh, CDC, about 40% of the cases of COVID-19 women are symptomatic. And the infectiousness of the symptomatic patient is third, three by four, that is uh, 70 percent compared to that of the symptomatic patient and the most common symptom of the coronavirus uh, virus are the fever or chills or cough shortness of breath myalgia fatigue diarrhea and nausea and the less common symptoms include new loss of sensation to smell that is anosmia or test or uh, sore throat congestion or runny nose speed and production headache dizziness anorexia and even uh, various uh, pulmonary thromboembolism cases can be seen in patient who has got uh, covid 19 and the uh, the, uh, there can be drip uh, brain thrombosis, including fatal uh, pulmonary embolism or chill brains uh, like lesions on the disease, also known as the COVID dose. And in some children and relatively younger adults, uh, symptomatic or symptomatic SARS CoV 2 infection may be followed by a multi system uh, inflammatory syndrome in children. And the persistent symptoms uh, such as shortness of breath, fatigue, myalgia, joint pain, chest pain, palpitation, headache, tremors, cognitive impairment, and a poor quality of life, anxiety, mood changes, and psychological distress can be present in the patient up to three months after the diagnosis of COVID-19. Hence, the term long COVID had been recently came in use. Now moving on to the investigation, you suspect a patient has got uh, upper uh, respiratory tract symptoms and you suspect a patient has got uh, COVID-19, then you must order a patient with a chest uh, radiogram. And in chest radiogram, you could find a various quite a range of uh, symptoms. The patient have, may have got a, a very normal chest radiogram or it could be a lower inflatory uh, or it could be a, uh, it could be a, uh, involvement of the segmental involved, lower involved, or the whole lung can be, bilateral lung can be affected. Or the other investigation that can be done is the high resolution CT scan, or you can even go for the blood test, like the compute blood count and the differential count, uh, in which you may see leukopenia and lymphopenia, and which is usually seen in 85% of the COVID-19 patient. And even you can uh, you should look for the renal function test and electrolyte test, or you can go for the liver function test, and you should look for the uh, troponin and you should look, uh, look for the uh, dimer uh, to see if the patient has got developed any complication or not and this sample should be sent for culture of appropriate specimen before starting antibiotic for any reason or if bacterial sepsis is suspected and now moving on to the diagnosis how to diagnose a uh, diagnose a patient with a coronavirus, uh, if the uh, patient has got uh, symptoms uh, and within first, if patient present to with you within first or second week, and you can go for the RT PCR test, or even you can look for the rapid antigen test. But however, if the patient present to with you after two weeks or three weeks, then you can, and the patient is in the recovery phase. Uh, and if you want to look if the patient had uh, uh, been uh, had uh, developed. Uh, developed coronavirus or had uh, recently been infected with coronavirus then you can look for the antibody test and it could be uh, uh, if it is initially you can see that uh, the antibody test will be positive for IgM and if it is uh, after uh, three four weeks then it will, could find out the, I, the antibody test will be positive for immunoglobulin G. Now moving on to the rapid diagnostic test. As I've already told you rapid diagnostic test can be uh, done to look if the patient has a uh, the symptoms for less than one or two weeks and uh, two weeks then you can start uh, you can do a rapid diagnosis it, though it has got low sensitivity and specificity uh, you can look for this uh, so that you can promptly start the patient on the treatment and uh, the next test that is uh, done is real-time reverse transcription polymerized uh, chain reaction uh, in which uh, the patient uh, the suspected patient uh, will be uh, the, the, the sample will be taken from the suspected patient from the oropharynx or the nasopharynx and the, uh, the sample will be subjected to lysis uh, buffer and the uh, sample will be uh, run for the, by the RT-PCR machine uh, and it, if there is any uh, viral particles uh, then that will be the amplified and there will be the detection of the COVID-19 uh, pneumonia. Now moving on to the classification of the disease. The disease can be classified uh, 
in the five categories, the first being the asymptomatic or presymptomatic infection in which individuals who test positive for SARS-CoV-2, but they don't have any symptoms. And the second uh, class is includes mild illness. These are the patient who has got uh, various signs and symptoms like fever, cough, sore throat, myalgia, chills, headache, muscle pain, diarrhea, without any uh, any shortness of breath, dyspnea, or abnormal imaging. And the third group of patients uh, are classified as moderate, having moderate illness. If the patient has got uh, evidence of low respiratory disease by clinical assessment or imaging, or if the oxygen saturation is, uh, uh, is uh, more, and the oxygen saturation is more than 92 percentage in the room here. Now the patient is categorized to have a severe illness if there is uh, any falling category like that is the respiratory rate is more than 30 with breath per minute or the oxygen saturation is less uh, 92 or less than 92 in room here or the rate ratio of the actual partial uh, pressure of the oxygen to fraction of the inspired oxygen is less than uh, 300 and the patient is uh, said to be categorized as the critical ill patient if the individual has the respiratory failure septic shock or patient has the multiple organ dysfunction we have to it is very important to categorize a patient who has got COVID-19 pneumonia so that we can will do the treatment accordingly according to the categorization. Uh, we should know there are a uh, very certain group of people who has got high risks of developing severe illness and such a uh, patient usually, usually are of the age of 60 or more or if or they have got one of the following medical conditions like obesity or cardiovascular diseases or a patient who have diabetes with HbA1c level of more than 7.5 or the patient may have uh, chronic uh, pulmonary disease including asthma or the patient has cro other chronic diseases like chronic kidney disease, advanced liver disease or sickle cell disease or cancer or neuro neurological or neurodevelopmental disorder or the patient may be a even a compromised state or maybe due to post-solid organ transplantation or the patient may be on immunosuppressive therapy or the patient has got use of biological, um, biological agent for the immunosuppression or even in the patient who, are, who have got uh, who are on post uh, marrow transplantation or who are undergoing, undergoing treatment for graft versus host uh, disease or the patient has got HIV infection pregnancy or the patient is of the low uh, socioeconomic activity or uh, you look for the uh, clinical findings uh, like the oxygen uh, saturation is 92 or less than 92 or in the laboratory finding you found out that there is elevated the timer level or there is absolute um, lymphocyte count uh, level of less than 0 0.8 or there is elevated level of lactate dehydrogenate troponin C-reactive protein or ferritin. Now moving on to the uh, treatment you uh, suspected a patient of uh, COVID-19 and you ask the patient to do a RT-PCR and you found out that the patient has got COVID-19 and you get after that you will do the categorization and with the categorization you start the treatment. If the patient falls uh, has got a symptomatic or presymptomatic uh, COVID-19 infection then the only treatment that is needed is you isolate the patient and uh, you do the other uh, supportive uh, treatment there is no need of any antibiotics or other uh, drugs uh, for the treatment of the coronavirus if the patient has got no any symptoms but if the patient has got mild disease again you should isolate the patient and you should uh, do the uh, regular monitoring of oxygen saturation uh, since rapid uh, worsening of the clinical status can occur and you should uh, so when to monitor a patient then for the vital parameters, you should usually monitor for the saturation for at least uh, six hourly. And you should inform the treating doc doctor if the saturation drops by more than 2% or uh, if the patient develops a fever, you can use the symptomatic treatments like antipyretics, uh, especially uh, paracetamol. And even in some cases, you can uh, treat the patient with inhaled budisonide uh, with 800 micrograms twice a day, uh, which can be uh, considered and it could be uh, discontinued upon resolution of the symptom or if the patient is started on the systemic corticosteroids. And for uh, moderate disease also, the isolation should be done and you should look always order for a chest x-ray and you should uh, monitor the saturation as the previous every six hourly and you should inform if uh, it decreases. Uh, and for uh, the patient who has got moderate disease, you should start on remdesivir 
with cost, uh, worsening uh, moderate COVID-19 for five days or until hospital discharge, uh, whichever comes first. And the dose is uh, 200 milligram on day one, followed by 100 milligram once daily on subs subsequent four days. Uh, if within 10 days from onset of symptom and they have got, if the patient uh, present to you within the 10 days uh, with the onset of the symptoms and they have significant breaks back to photographing severe illness or rapidly progressing radiograph finding or dropping oxygen saturation. And you, you should also uh, give, uh, start the patient with inhaled uh, borisonide 800 micrograms uh, uh, twice a day. And for the patient who has got uh, severe disease you, disease, you must admit the patient. And uh, for the patient who are hypoxic and who are not uh, in respiratory uh, distress, you can just give the supplementary oxygen and we should be given via, via natural cannula up to four to six liter per minute or uh, via venturi max or non rebreathing max with reserve of 10 to 15 liter per minute uh, so that your saturation will be between 92 to 96 percent. And uh, you should consider the using of the high flow natural cannula or venturi max if the requirement for the oxygen goes uh, from is more than four liter per minute and the patient uh, should be advised to ambulate within the isolated unit at least it every four uh, few hours when awake and the prophylactic dose of the anticoagulation is recommended in all hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 unless anticoagulation is contraindication such as uh, there is presence of severe thrombocytopenia or active uh, bleeding. And uh, for uh, pharmacological prophylaxis, one of the following may be used like uh, enoxavarin, del deltipedin or fondaparinox or unfractionated heparin. And uh, you should know that there is no role of antiplatelet therapy for uh, DVD prophylaxis, and you should always uh, treat the patient with uh, treat the patient with uh, dexamethasone, and that is with a dose of six milligram per day for up to ten days or until hospital discharge, whichever comes first. Uh, and it should be given in the patient who has got severe COVID-19. Uh, even you can uh, use prednisolone 40 mg once a day or methylprednisolone 32 mg uh, given into one to four divided doses per day or hydrocortisone 160 milligram per day. That is 50 milligram every eight hours, eight hourly or 100 uh, milligram every, every uh, 12 hourly. And as I've told you, uh, remdesivir is recommended for use in patients who are uh, who are who present within the 10 days from the onset of the symptoms and have severe COVID-19 requiring low flow oxygen. And the other uh, drugs that can be used is uh, tocilizumab, and it is given as a single dose of 8 mg per kg with maximum dose of 800 mg when available and it may be considered in patient with severe or critical COVID-19. And uh, since uh, there is risk of uh, disseminated a stronger light doses, prophylactic treatment with ivermectin, uh, that is 200 micrograms per kg per day for two days, uh, should be given in the patient who will be started on the tocilizumab. Now, how to manage a critical ill patient? Uh, the critical uh, ill patient may have uh, may develop acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS or septic shock, and the patient may develop distributed shock or cardiac dysfunction, and there could be a uh, multiple inflammatory elevation, multiple inflam uh, inflammatory cytokines that can provoke a cytokine storm or a exacerbation of underlying comorbidities, and the patient may can also experience cardiac, hepatic, renal, or CNS uh, disease in addition to pulmonary disease. So in the such cases, if the patient has got other comorbidities and the involvement of various symptoms or the patient presents in shock, which could be septic, distributic or any shock, then you should uh, keep the patient in the ICU. And the indication for ICU admission includes respiratory failure requiring ventilator support such as non using ventilator or high flow nasal cannula or the mechanical ventilation or there is serious presence of shock or multi-organ failure or uh, you do a AVG and the order AVG and you found out that the PO2 by FiO2 ratio is less than 200 mm of your SpO2 or FiO2 ratio is uh, 235 or less than 235 millimeter of mercury. And in such case, and uh, you should, uh, with uh, the treatment drugs, uh, treatment of COVID-19, you should also do the treatment of ARDS, and that is done by oxygen therapy and continuous monitoring by prone positioning by use of high flow natural cannula or non-invasive ventilation. Or if the patient, uh, even despite doing all these, the patient is hypoxic, uh, then you may even need the intratracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation support. And here are the list of uh, antiviral or 
uh, and immunomodulatory uh, drugs that can be used in the patient who have got COVID-19. Uh, the first being the dexamethasone, which is given is the dose of 6 mg per day. And uh, the next uh, being, uh, which are being tried, includes ivermectin, that is 200 microgram per day, uh, per kg per day for one to two days, or it could be a tocilizumab, uh, which is given in the single dose, or uh, favipiramil. Is an, uh, it is an inhibitor of uh, viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and it is a recently used drug. Uh, the other therapy that uh, can be given is the convalescent uh, plasma therapy. However, this uh, role is uh, not, on th uh, not clear, and uh, ha though it has not uh, been uh, seen to show any beneficial, uh, however, some clinician uh, prefers to use it uh, in cases of, in the cases of who has present too early to the hospital and uh, you should always do the treatment of the co-infection if there is any co-infection in the patient who has got COVID-19 also you should look for the fute management and you should do the deep, uh, deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. Uh, now uh, discussion in detail about the management of ARDS secondary to COVID-19, you should keep the patient in the prone position. And the other thing, uh, therapy that can be beneficial in the patient with COVID-19 who has got severe hypoxia despite uh, the use of all the measures like uh, oxygen supplementation or even mechanical intubation is the extracorporeal corporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO therapy. Also, you should uh, look for the ventilation bundle, that is elevation of uh, bed, uh, height of the bed uh, by 30 to 45 degree, daily sedation, sedation interruption or daily spontaneous uh, breathing trials on giving the deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis and stress ulcer prophylaxis. Other thing you should uh, look for is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use of drugs. Uh, NSAIDs, uh, you should uh, look for the nutritional support, psychosocial support. And uh, if uh, despite all these uh, cures, if the patient is not improving uh, and there is uh, improving, uh, then and the patient has got various comorbidities, uh, then also you should uh, look for the end of life care and care of the dying patient. And uh, the, most, uh, the most important thing is the use of uh, resource utilization during this uh, period of the crisis. Now uh, you do the proper treatment and the patient is uh, improving now when to uh, step down the patient from the ICU. Uh, there is a certain criteria for the step down from the ICU to the ICU in ward and that includes uh, the patient uh, is hemodynamically stable and there is no need of any vasopressure support, uh, support for eight hours or more than eight hours and the patient is off ventilator for more than 24 hours and the uh, oxygen saturation is uh, more than 92 with FIO2 requirement of less than 35 then you can consider the consider shifting the patient from ICU to the isolation wards. And uh, as you know, there are various uh, vaccines available for the prevention of the COVID-19 infection and uh, which includes um, Covishield or uh, Oxford AstraZeneca, which is a non-replicating uh, uh, chimpanzee adenovirus vector uh, vaccine, and which is administered intramuscularly. Two doses is given eight to 12 weeks apart, and it is approved for over 18 years old uh, by the and the WHO has listed in, listed for UA. And the other uh, group of uh, vaccines include uh, develop, as developed by the Sinopharm or Sputnik V uh, vaccine or a co-vaccine and the Sinovac or Coronavac. Okay, uh, this is... Uh, this is uh, some of the vaccines and their comparison. And you can see that uh, there are various uh, group of vaccines developed by the various pharmaceuticals. And the most uh, common being the Oxford Uni, uh, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer, and Biotech, and Sputnik V. And they have got, uh, they're all, all uh, effectiveness uh, ranging from 62 to 95 percent, and the maximum effectiveness being of the Moderna and Pfizer. And uh, you should, uh, and you should uh, choose uh, the vaccination to your patient or to the people uh, population as compared to the availability of uh, availability and the cost. Okay, that is all for today. Stay safe and vaccinated. Thank you.